All right, today we want to talk about free will and determinism. And in particular, we're going to ask three questions, which will appear on your screen. First question is this, are human choices determined? And then if your answer to that question is yes, they are determined. First question is, uh, what causes determine human choices? And then next, is free will or responsibility compatible with that kind of determinism? And next, if your answer is no, human choices are not determined by anything, we wanna ask a further question. Is free will compatible with indeterminism? There are difficult questions all along the line here. So let's start with that first question. Um, are human choices determined? And first, we need to get clear on exactly what we mean by this word determined. So when we say that some cause determines a choice, it doesn't just mean that that cause influences your choice or makes your choice more likely. What we mean is that the cause guarantees what your choice will be 100%. All right, so with that definition in mind, how would you answer the question, are human choices determined? And let's make this concrete with an example. Let's say that Amy decides to knock down Bob. Here's my question for you. What causes, but what caused her to make that choice? What caused her to make that choice? Now, let me give you three possible causes uh, for Amy's choice that come to mind. You might say, well, it was her mental or psychological state at the time, including her beliefs, her desires, and her dispositions that uh, caused her to knock down Bob. That's one possible answer. Here's another possible answer, not necessarily uh, exclusive of the first one. You might say that her brain state at the time caused her to knock down Bob. And her brain state here, what I mean is the, the firing synapses in her brain, the chemistry that's going on in there, um, and so forth. You might think that that is what caused her to knock down Bob to choose to do that. And then here's another one. Maybe it was God or another non-physical being that caused her to choose to knock down Bob. These are just three possible options that philosophers often discuss. Maybe you've got some more options on the table too. That's fine. Okay. You might think it was a combination of all three of these causes, which um, led her to, to make this choice. For example, you might think, well, God created her with a certain kind of brain and that brain produced in her a certain kind of psychological state and that psychological state then produced her choice. That, that's one option. Or you might think it was a combination of maybe only of two of these, or maybe it was only one of them uh, or, or some fourth option. Whatever you think, produced Amy's choice, here's the question I want you to, to ask now. Do you think that any of those causes or any combination of those causes that I just listed determine Amy's choice to knock down Bob? Do you think that those, those causal factors guaranteed made it inevitable that she would choose to knock down Bob. What do you think about that? Now, if your answer to that question is yes, one of those causes or some combination of them determined Amy to choose to knock down Bob, then you are a determinist. If your answer is no, they didn't determine her, they just made it more likely or something, then you're an indeterminist. Now, let me give you really precise definitions of those two terms. Determinism is the view that the sum total states of affairs prior to my choice, say choice C, at time T 
necessarily determines what I will choose at time t. Any other choice is impossible. So when I talk about the, the sum total states of affairs prior to my choice at that time, think about Amy in the instant before she chooses to knock down Bob. What are the states of affairs that I have in mind? Well, her brain states, her psychological states, maybe God and what God has done or chosen or something like that. Those are, if you think that um, you know, all of those states together or some of them individually make it impossible for her to make any other choice at time T, then you are a determinist. If you think, no, even if all that stuff was the same, she could have done otherwise, then you're an indeterminist. Okay, that's what the two views are. Actually, it can be even more nuanced than that because there, there might be several different kinds of determinism based upon which kinds of causes you think determine our choices. So um, there, you might believe in physical determinism. Physical determinism is the view that physical laws of nature and physical states of affairs determine human choices. So if, if it's Amy's brain states that determine her choice, you're a physical determinist. You might be a psychological determinist. You think, oh, it's her psychological states, her beliefs and desires that determine uh, choices. Well, then you're a psychological determinist. And you might be a theological determinist who thinks that God determines what human choices will be. And like I said before, um, these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. You might believe in that in, in all three of them or two of them or, or what, what have you. Those may or may not be good positions to hold, but I mean, it's, they seem possible. Now, the kind of determinism that contemporary philosophers tend to worry about most often and talk about most often is physical determinism. And that's because most contemporary analytic philosophers are physicalists. Do you remember what physicalism is from our previous unit? That's the belief that the only things that exist are physical things. There are no non-physical entities. And in particular, the human, human beings are purely physical. Um, the thing is, there's a plausible argument that leads from physicalism to physical determinism. And that's why philosophers tend to spend a lot of energy these days talking about physical determinism. Here's the, I think, the way the argument would run. Premise one. If all physical events are determined by physical causes, then brain events are determined by physical causes because you know brains are physical. Well, many philosophers assume. Premise two, all physical events are determined by physical causes. And it follows from that that therefore brain events are determined by physical causes. Um, so if, and if physicalism is true, then all choices are nothing but brain events. It's synapses firing in your brain. So it follows then finally that if physicalism is true, all of our choices are determined by physical causes. So that's why philosophers spend a lot of time worrying about physical determinism. Of course, if you're not a physicalist, then you won't have this exactly the same concerns. Uh, you won't have the same kinds of worries necessarily. Okay, so far, here's what we've considered. We've considered this first question of whether our choices are determined and what kinds of causes our choices might be determined by. Now, let's say for the sake of argument that you are some kind of determinist. You might not be, but pretend. Now we wanna consider the implications that determinism might have for free will. We haven't been talking about free will exactly yet. More specifically, we want to ask whether free will is compatible with determinism. Once again, we need to start by defining our terms. Um, as we'll see, philosophers disagree on what free will really involves. But one thing that most philosophers agree on 
is that free will is a necessary condition for moral responsibility, for being uh, responsible for your choices or your actions, for, for being blameworthy or praiseworthy, uh, for being culpable uh, for, for what you do. And this is one reason why the question of free will seems to matter to us so much. We feel as though morality depends upon the existence of free will. If we're not free, then we can't be punished or rewarded for our actions any more than rocks can for rolling down a hill. Well, that basic insight leads to an initial kind of approximate characterization of freedom or free will in, in terms of moral responsibility. For our purposes, let's say that an act is free if and only if it's the kind of act for which the agent, that is the actor, is morally responsible, blameworthy and praiseworthy. Philosophers often summarize this idea with the slogan, ought implies can. And what they mean by that is that moral responsibility implies that you have freedom. If we're morally responsible, then we must be um, uh, free to do or to not do the act for which we are responsible. Ought implies can. Now, this initial characterization of freedom doesn't quite settle the definition of, of free will. It just is, gives us another question to ask. And that question is this, what kinds of acts are we morally responsible for? More specifically, are you morally responsible for an action if your choice to do that action was determined? Is free will and moral responsibility with it compatible with determinism? Now, there are two possible answers to this question, yes and no. If you answer yes, then you are a compatibilist. Compatibilism is the view that free will is indeed compatible with determinism. Even if your choice is determined, it's still free, or at least it might be. Incompatibilism is the view that free will is not compatible with determinism. If my choice is determined, it's not free. It's not morally responsible. All right, so you might think about this. Wait, what do you think? Is free will determinate, compatible with determinism or not? And actually, I hate to complicate your life, but there's more than just these two positions because there's different kinds of compatible. I mean, there's different kinds of determinism. And you might take a different view about whether free will is compatible with these different kinds of determinism. So you might have different answers to these questions. Is physical determinism compatible with free will? Yes or no. Is psychological determinism compatible with free will? Is theological determinism compatible with free will? Let's look at one example of a compatibilist philosophical view, that of W.T. Stace from your readings. Stace thinks that psychological determinism is compatible with freedom. So on Stace's view, acts that are freely chosen are acts whose immediate causes are psychological states of affairs in the agent. So for example, if Amy chose to push Bob and knock him down because of because she was determined by her own desires. Maybe she had this deep desire to see Bob humiliated publicly by falling on his face. If that's what determined her choice, then it was a free choice. She did it. She's responsible for it, even though given her psychology, she couldn't have chosen otherwise. That desire to see um, Bob publicly humiliated was so strong and overpowering and she believed so strongly that this was an effective way to achieve that that she couldn't have done otherwise. On the other hand, acts that are not freely chosen are those whose immediate causes are states of affairs external to the agent and in particular 
external to the agent's own psychology. So for example, if Amy uh, knocked Bob down because uh, Kathy knocked Amy into Bob, well, then Stace would say that wouldn't be free. I mean, it was Kathy who knocked into Amy to knock Bob down. It wasn't a free choice to do so. Okay, but as long as what caused Amy to knock Bob down was her own psychology, then it's free, even though it was also determined. On the other hand, so that's, a, that's an example of a compatibilist view. Now for a contrasting kind of view, let's think about the incompatibilist and how the incompatibilist views the situation. And again, we've got an example from your reading from Thomas Nagel. So Nagel is an incompatibilist. Nagel thinks freedom is incompatible with any kind of determinism, including psychological determinism. Here's what he says. If I thought that everything I did was determined by my circumstances and my psychological condition, I would feel trapped. And if I thought the same about everybody else, I would feel like they were a lot of puppets. Well, what do you think? Do you think that free will is compatible with some kind of determinism? Or do you think that any kind of determinism would just make us puppets? Okay, let's now bring together the results of our two questions that we've asked. The first question is this, do you think that human choices are in fact determined? And the second question is, do you think that determinism is compatible with freedom? These two questions, each with two possible answers generate four possible positions on free will and determinism. So I want you to try to figure out where you fit on this grid, okay? You might believe that yes, determinism is true, but it's compatible with freedom. In that case, you're in this first grid. We have free will, you're like Stace. You might think, yeah, determinism is true, and unfortunately, it's not compatible with freedom. So unfortunately, we have no free will. That is, that might be Nagel's view. You might think, you know what? Um, determinism is not compatible with free will. However, good news, determinism is false. Indeterminism is true. Nothing determines our choices. And therefore, we still have free will. Now that's the kind of view that is held by um, Richard Swinburne, who we read earlier. Do you remember when we read about the problem of evil? Swinburne said, hey, God created a world in which people have free and responsible choices. And by, by freedom, Swinburne means um, not determined by anything, even God. Okay, so Swinburne believes in indeterminism and he believes that we do have free will yeah, we do have free will. Now there's another view that, that you might, that it's possible, but this is not one that's commonly defended. And that you might think that, well, hey, free will is compatible with determinism, but you know what? Determinism is false, so it doesn't even matter. And in that case, you might, you might think, well, we have free will. Um, however, most people who are indeterminists are also incompatibilists. Um, Wait, I'm sorry. Yes, when it comes to, that's right. That's exactly, so that you don't, this other quadrant is kind of a, don't worry about it too much. Now, in light of this chart, here's what you might be thinking at this point. You might think, well, it seems like the only threat to free will that I need to worry about is determinism. It seems like if you're not a determinist, there's really no, no problems, like no threats to free will, right? Uh, it's not quite so easy. There's problems, uh, possible threats to free will, even if you are an indeterminist. Think for a second about a kind of challenge that Thomas Nagel raises. Nagel says this, if an action wasn't determined in advance by your desires, beliefs, and personality, among other things, then it seems to be something that just happened without any explanation. In other words, the action doesn't seem to be your doing. 
It doesn't seem to be your action. Look, if Amy chose to push Bob over, but it wasn't because she desired to, uh, maybe she like really desired for uh, Bob to flourish as a human being and to retain his personal dignity and for everything to go well in his life. And then made a choice, totally disconnected from those desires and beliefs to knock him down is that even Amy's choice or did she just get struck by lightning or something? Except in this case, it's not struck by lightning, it's struck by nothing because nothing determined that choice, not even her mind. Is it even Amy's choice at that point? point? Can we even hold her responsible for what she's done and for the choice if it had uh, no determinate connection to anything going on in her at all or anything in the world? Um, that's the question. So here's, here's the question. Um, but now, now some people want to say, whoa, 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 Nagel. You know what? It's true that nothing about Amy's psychology determined her choice. But it still was her choice. In other words, here's what they think. They think that even though our choices are not determined by any of um, our psychological characteristics, our desires, or our beliefs, um, they're still our choices for which we are responsible. Free action, this is Nagel summarizing uh, the view. He says, free, free action is just a basic feature of the world, and it can't be analyzed. You think, well, what makes that choice Amy's if it's not connected to her personality at all? And they're like, can't give an answer to that. It's just a brute fact. It's her choice. Now, Nagel doesn't find that satisfying. He thinks indeterminism is not compatible with moral responsibility or with, or with free choice. If, if the choice wasn't determined by Amy's psychology, it's not free. That's Nagel's view. But some people say, like, no, it is. It simply is. Well, what do you think? If nothing about me or anything determines what I choose, is it still my choice in any meaningful way? If you answer that, yes, it's still my choice, then you're a compatibilist about freedom and indeterminism. If you answer no, then you are an incompatibilist about freedom and indeterminism. And once again, this generates four possible positions. Try, try to locate yourself on this grid. So you might believe that, um, that, the, that indeterminism is compatible with freedom. And in that case, if you believe that um, indeterminism is the case, uh, then you might believe, oh, we still have free will because indeterminism is compatible with freedom. Now that's the kind of view that someone like Swinburne holds. He thinks your, your choices aren't determined by anything, but they are still your choices and they're still free. You might, however, be on Nagel's side with this. You think, look, indeterminism, indeterminism might be real, but indeterminism is not compatible with freedom. Like if my choices aren't determined by my psychology, they aren't my choices. Okay, so in that case, no free will, even though indeterminism is the case. You might be somebody like Stace who thinks um, indeterminism is incompatible with freedom, but indeterminism is false. Determinism is true. Actually, your choices are determined by your psychology, and therefore you do have free will. That would be like the Stace type view. And then again, there's a fourth quadrant, which is not often um, defended. And that would say, look, um, indeterminism is compatible with free will, but indeterminism is not the case. Everything is determined, actually. Don't worry about that one. Now, I, I fear that you might have gotten really confused at this slide if you weren't already, because I'm, I started using compatibilism and incompatibilism in kind of an unusual sense. Usually when philosophers use these words, compatibilism and incompatibilism, they're talking about the compatibility of freedom with determinism. 
But in this, on this slide and on this slide only, I'm using those words to talk about the compatibility of freedom and indeterminism. So bear that in mind. In case you feel like you don't have enough to think about yet or to worry about, let me conclude by just tying this back into our discussion of God and evil from earlier. Now, I've been referencing Swinburne, so I've kind of already been drawing this connection. Um, Swinburne is an incompatibilist when it comes to determinism and freedom. He thinks if you're determined, you're not free. But um, he thinks that there is no determinism. Um, now, that's a, this is an important part of his defense, his theodicy, right? Because he thinks that, look, because they're incompatible, God can't create free creatures and at the same time determine that they always choose the right thing. If God's going to create free creatures, he's going to open up the possibility of evil, but it's worth it because freedom is so awesome. Okay, so that's an incompatibilist free will defense. Not all theists take that view. Other theists, like, for example, John Calvin, the 16th century Protestant theologian, um, affirm compatibilism, and they think theological determinism is true. So if you think of theological determinism, you might think of the word predestination. God chooses and determines everything that comes to pass, even human choices, even bad ones. Calvin thinks people are free and God uh, predestines and determines everything. Both of those are true. God's uh, sovereign predestination does not eliminate human freedom. In fact, it makes it possible. Now, in Calvin's view, he couldn't use Swinburne's free will defense, nor would he want to. He would say, look, God could create free creatures and at the same time determine their choices. In fact, that, that is what he thinks. But that Calvin's view raises another question, which Swinburne would want to press. If God could have created a world with free and responsible choice and yet have determined those choices so that they were never bad ones, why did he do so? Why would a good God who could create free creatures that never went wrong, why wouldn't that God do that? That question merits further discussion, which we won't pursue here. And some of you are grateful because you've got enough to worry about already. So I'll leave you to ponder those points.